Well, it's time to say hello to all our attendees of this wonderful opportunity to talk to John Rutter, whose concert you are going to be enjoying in an hour and a half's time, special Christmas celebration, the latest of this wonderful tradition that's set up between the RPO and normally the Royal Albert Hall and John. But this year, John, of course, somewhat different, but lovely to see you and uh, very, very nice of you to chat to us all. Tell us how this year is going to be different. Well, um, it had to be different because the formula for the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra concerts I've been doing for almost 20 years now at Christmas time was just not going to be possible because for one thing, the audience would not be allowed to sing and that means that a large part of what people come for was not going to happen. We weren't going to be allowed a large choir on the stage and the orchestra was going to have to be quite reduced in numbers. So one way and another, I thought, um, no, that doesn't feel right, but I know what would feel right, and that's a Christmas event held in one of our wonderful cathedrals. I always feel at home in a cathedral. Um, my local one in Ely, in Cambridgeshire, where I live, um, is like a second home to me. And my thoughts turned to St Albans Cathedral, which is reputedly the oldest site of Christian worship in Britain. And there it sits on top of its hill. And I thought, I wonder if the Dean and Chapter might allow us to come in and celebrate Christmas within those hallowed walls. And uh, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra wrote a terribly polite letter and the, the Dean uh, got back immediately and said, yes, we'd be delighted to have you welcome. And so we're sharing Christmas and our celebration of it from a very different setting from the Royal Albert Hall. But my goodness me, what a remarkable one it is. This has been an extraordinary year and I found it awfully reassuring that within the stout walls of that cathedral, men and women had experienced the Black Death <laughs> and the Great Plague of 1665, the terrible flu pandemic of 1918-19, and now this year, all of what we have gone through. And I thought, well, um, you know, there is something reassuring about the solidity and the history and of course the fantastic visual beauty of the cathedral which dare I say you never see to better effect than when it's lit for television um, oh, because you, you can go into all the dark corners and see details of that wonderful stonework that normally are, are sort of shrouded slightly in darkness so um, I thought this would be an absolutely wonderful place and um, we got the permission to do it and beauty of being able to work in a setting like that is that you don't have to stay in one place. In the Albert Hall you're fairly much uh, rooted to the spot I mean, it's a wonderful spot but in St Albans you can move around and there are so many lovely parts of the cathedral where you can shoot your music and we were in the north transept which I always think looks rather like a Mediterranean church it's got those lovely round topped arches from the Romanesque period and then there is the mighty nave um, with the organ at the west end of it sorry the east well it's midway along the cathedral but if you're looking from the west door then of course you're looking eastwards towards the organ which divides the cathedral into two then you've got the crossing um, which if you shoot a, a cross from one side to another which is what we did um, you get a lovely view of the rose window and then there is the Lady Chapel at the extreme east end of the cathedral and we used all of those four locations for different parts of the programme. And that's something that we couldn't have done if we'd stayed in the Royal Albert Hall. The other thing we couldn't have done is to allow people to enjoy the programme globally. Um, because there are many who write to me and say we wish we could come to London to be at the Royal Albert Hall concerts but we live in Washington State or we live in New South Wales or we live in Taiwan or wherever it might be and of course this is the first time that we've been able to 
bring our Christmas celebration to people wherever they may be in the world. So it was, it was a very special challenge, quite different from our usual, but we hope it was worth doing. Well, I know that everybody who's watching now will be looking forward to the concert, and I should also just welcome you all to the Zoom, uh, this Zoom sort of experience, but also, isn't it lovely, you get an opportunity to ask John questions as well, and I would urge you to do that, uh, you're very much amongst friends, there's a and a box that you can open on this uh, Zoom facility, and just type them in there, and we will, uh, I will make sure that John gets to see them if he doesn't see them before I do indeed. <laughs> As I say, we're all very relaxed here this evening for the next hour or so. But John, just to go back to this wonderful concert that you have prepared for us, as you say, to this potentially international audience, which is such a wonderful silver lining, if you like, of, of uh, the circumstances of 2020. Talk to us about the music that you've chosen for this concert and also for some of the soloists and, and musicians who you've brought together, because I know a lot of them are friends more than soloists and musical colleagues aren't they they're people you've got strong links with oh yes um, well over the years in our profession you do develop not just professional admiration for your colleagues but you develop long-lasting friendships too and so it was um, a very easy step for me to request the services of two very good friends and colleagues of mine, Melanie Marshall, who works mainly in the world of the musical theatre these days, but my goodness me, she's a wonderful classical singer also. And she um, agreed immediately to be part of it, as did another wonderful singer, um, Roderick Williams, known to all his many friends as Roddy. And I'm sure you've introduced him on many an occasion, Katie. Um, <laughs> he shares um, his gift in the same way that Melanie does generously. And when you feel that he's singing, it's singing just for you. And so uh, they were cornerstones right from the very first. And then I started to think about a choir. Well, it wasn't going to be possible to have a full-size choir with the social distancing constraints, but I have worked a number of times over the years with a brilliant young vocal ensemble called Voce's Eight, and they are eight uh, rather cool, wonderful singers um, who've been building quite a reputation over the years. I remember that I introduced one of their very first concerts. They must have formed, oh, 10 years ago, perhaps, maybe a little longer than that. Some changes of membership, but they are extraordinary and very versatile, as you will hear, because they're equally at home with a medieval carol or with um, a piece of vocal jazz or close harmony. So I asked tentatively whether they might be willing to be in it, and I was delighted to receive a yes. Then, on top of that, I have always tried to involve children or young people in the Christmas concerts that I do, because they are the future of, well, not just choral music, but music generally. And I happen to be one of the judges on the BBC Young Chorister of the Year competition. Now, I don't really like competitions because life isn't a race and um, a competition is a very subjective thing, um, but good things do come out of them, which is the unveiling of talent that you might not have known was there. And uh, the Young Chorister of the Year, and I was not allowed to say this until the final was televised on Sunday, uh, but his name is Alexander Ollison. He was chorister in Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford until he actually outgrew that. He's just turned 14, but he still has, I think, a lovely treble voice and extraordinary musicianship. So he is representing the voice of youth, as it were, because we couldn't have a whole children's choir. And that was a regret, but my goodness me, um, Alexander makes up for it. Then, not just the music, but what about the words? Um, Christmas is full of wonderful texts, not only from the Bible, but from the poets down the ages, um, serious and sometimes rather more lighthearted. And I thought, well, um, you turn to the world of the theatre, Katie, I mean, uh, for, for that sort of a thing, um, because it's not as easy to read a lesson in church as you might think it is. 
it's got to be somewhere halfway between news reading, which is supposed to be objective, and acting, where you are actually being whoever it is. And if you do that, you can be accused of overdoing it when you read. So it's a rather subtle art. And I thought, well, I know just who can do it. I've been an admirer of his for many years, Simon Callow. And again, imagine our delight when he came back with a yes. So we had our team in place to support the wonderful Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. And so really, once you've got the people in place, the music almost follows on from that. So tell us a little bit then about the variety of musical genres that you've managed to sort of interweave with this lovely talent lineup. Well, um, Christmas is both a uh, secular and very much a sacred yes. festival. Yes. And long before Christianity was on the scene, in the Northern Hemisphere, there was always a midwinter celebration, a jolly, um, when you drank the mead and you ate up the last of the slaughtered animals from the summer before they started to go off. You know, you salted them, but they wouldn't last all winter. So December was a really good chance to feast and make merry. And then along came Christianity, and it almost jumped on the back of it, uh, really, sometime in the Middle Ages. And one of the things that you find if you study medieval Christmas carols, which I have done a little bit, is that they gloriously combine the feasting, the rejoicing, the roistering, the wassailing, where you go around and demand money with menaces, you know, rather like trick-or-treating, but it's an age-old custom. Um, and at the same time, you're celebrating a great Christian festival. And uh, I think that's rather wonderful in a way because it's inclusive. Everybody can join in and enjoy Christmas in their own different ways. And if you think of um, an English carol like the Holly and the Ivy, which is part of our programme, it is both sacred and secular because you've got the rising of the sun and the running of the deer. And those are pagan images, right? And at the same time, you've got the playing of the merry organ, sweet singing in the choir, which is Christian. And so the two mingle in, I think, a rather lovely way. And that gave me really the clue for the music that I wanted to have in our programme, um, because it begins very much on a sacred note. Um, Ding dong merrily on high. Well, um, the words are pretty much nonsense, but um, we all love them anyway, and it's a great tune. Um, you can forgive a lot if there's a good tune involved, don't you think? Um, <laughs> and then we, we tell the Christmas story. And uh, I mean, it's an obvious thing to do, but um, uh, Roddy Williams uh, reminds us that this is the truth sent from above, the truth of God, the God of love. Therefore, don't turn me from your door, but hearken all both rich and poor. And it's the promise of redemption. We follow it through with the Annunciation to the Virgin Mary and then um, the birth itself and rejoicing. And then we switch gears into being rather more secular. Um, with Simon Callow reading a poem I've loved since I was about six or seven years old, and that's King John's Christmas. Um, and it starts with King John was not a good man, he had his little ways. And of course I was baptised John, and it's a terribly unlucky name for royalty because uh, one of the few that is remembered um, almost entirely negatively was poor old King John and they made him sign the Magna Carta, which he didn't terribly want to do. Um, I wrote a piece in celebration of that, I remember, just uh, three or four years ago. And so his Christmas is blessed eventually by the gift of a big India rubber ball from Father Christmas. And that sends us into a mood of fairly secular rejoicing. Um, we, we have deck the, decking the hall with boughs of holly, um, which is a Welsh carol that has nothing whatsoever to do with Christmas originally. Um, it was, I believe, all about the glories and beauties of Wales, which is great, but um, it, it somehow got hijacked and some words were put to it which have stuck. And so we'll forever be decking the halls with boughs of holly, fa-la-la-la-la. -la -la -la. Um, 
uh, th then comes a, a, a moment that's, that's actually rather meaningful. Um, I love the sentimental songs associated with Christmas. Um, I'm dreaming of a white one, right? Um, but a, a, a two particular favourites of mine are uh, the Christmas song by Mel Torme, Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire. Um, can't resist it. And of course, it was famously written in a heat wave in Los Angeles sometime in, in the 1940s, but um, well, uh, who cares? And then um, a, a particularly significant one, I think, in this year, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. Um, well, it was written for an MGM film called Meet Me in St. Louis uh, when World War II was raging. And of course, uh, the words go, someday soon we all will be together if the fates allow. And of course, many people were destined not to see their loved ones again. Um, it was a terrible time, an anxious time. Um, Judy Garland always sang that, she, she sang it in the original film, but she sang it often at troop concerts and reduced whole audiences of strong men to tears. And it still does have that effect, but I just find the words very, very poignant um, in, in this particular year. And um, I think you can even see, and um, Melanie, who uh, is one of the soloists in it, um, I think you can see uh, her eyes misting up a bit as we get to the end of it. And so uh, that really is the thought in our hearts. Someday soon we all will be together. But we end up. Um, shall I reveal the secret of the ending to the concert, Katie? Is that all right? I think, as I say, we're amongst friends. <laughs> we're amongst so, friends. Okay, well, um, okay, so Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Um, 5,000 people sing it in the Albert Hall when we have done it there at the close of our concerts. And I thought, well, I wonder if we might just be able to sneak a four figure number of singers in. And we all know about this incredible phenomenon of virtual choirs that have sprung up this year. And I happen to have been approached by um, one of them, the Stay at Home Choir. And Tori Longdon, their wonderful conductor, said, um, would you be willing to um, do some sort of an accompaniment with orchestra to Heart the Herald Angels sing? And I said, well, it's funny you should ask. Uh, we wanted to include it in our concert in St Albans, um, but we've only got eight singers um, plus our three soloists. And I'd like a bit more than that, mm -hmm. um, a few more. And she said, well, I've got something like 800 of them, I think it was, and I'm like, yes! Um, and, and so they joined in, they recorded their contributions, voice by voice, in their own homes, sent them up, and a, a sound wizard mixed them all together, and there they all are, singing along with us, and you can actually see everybody's face as a tiny little coloured tile mosaic. Um, in the cathedral, surrounding all of the performers. Um, it's like fairyland, it's magical. Oh, that sounds um, absolutely um, beautiful, I must say. What a wonderful thing to, to, to include. Really, really uh, wonderful, yeah. Uh, Christmas should be inclusive. It should be a season that brings us all together. And I hope that the fact we had those hundreds of extra willing singers um, for our finale does symbolize that um, we are doing everything we can to be together at this, at this difficult time, challenging time. But I do think uh, sincerely that positive things have come out of this year for musicians alongside a whole lot of very difficult things. And I want to talk a little bit more about your thoughts on that a little later, but I just want to stick with Christmas just for a while, because of course you have been associated with your, your musical work for Christmas since the very beginning of your career. Am I right that you were 18 when you wrote Shepherd's Pipe Carol? That's about it, but I can go back even further than that because my first published composition ever was written when I was 16, and that's called The Nativity Carol. Hey. Um, there we are. Know it! Oh, thank you. Um, that's made my day. Born in a stable so bad, dee 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 dee. And I was encouraged to write it at school for a competition. 
being run by the Bach Choir in London, and the adjudicator was none other than their eminent conductor, Sir David Wilcox, who I did not know except as a famous name in the world of choral music. So um, the brief was to write a carol that could be sung by the Bach Choir, but with the audience joining in. Well, I wrote the Nativity Carol and I sent it up and it didn't win. Um, no, it didn't win. Uh, it probably didn't help that the tune goes up to a top F sharp. And um, those of you that know about vocal ranges will realize that that's slightly off limits at the top end for most audience singers. And well, there we are. However, um, even though it wasn't published, um, it, it, uh, sorry, well, it, it didn't win the competition, but it, it actually was published. That's, that's right. I think a year or so afterwards, I, it, it, it did get published, put into print by um, my long-standing publisher, Oxford University Press. And uh, I should say this, I shouldn't, but it did rather well commercially. You know, it got around a little four page thing. Well, fast forward, Katie, about eight years to when I was very honored to be asked to be the co-editor of the second volume of the Carols for Choirs series, the Orange Book. Um, which, um, of course, uh, was the second in a series that had begun with the Green Book, Carols for Choirs One, um, done in 1961, uh, when I was still in short trousers. But um, by the time we got to 1970, I was a graduate student at Cambridge, and Sir David Wilcox's erstwhile collaborator on Volume One, uh, Reginald Jakes, had sadly died. And David didn't want to do the book on his own, and so he asked me to co-edit. Well, every Friday night, we would consider the possible carols that we would or would not include. Um, we would go to the dining room in his house in Cambridge, and there would be a pile of, of manuscripts and printed pieces there. Um, and we look them through and say, yes, have that one in, or no, I don't like that one. And to my embarrassment, um, I think it's my publisher had sent it along. There was the Nativity Carol as a possible inclusion. And David Wilcox said to me, oh, well, John, we must have that in the book. Yes, yes, yes. Of Did course. he remember? Did he remember well, where he'd seen I, it first? Or? <laughs> I don't know, but I reminded him. I, <laughs> very tactless of me, but I said, David, just a minute. I said, you looked at that carol uh, for that competition in um, whatever year it was, 1962 or three. And not only did it not win, you didn't even give it a highly commended. And of course he knew about its subsequent history and he looked at it and he said, well, I think it's improved remarkably since then. <laughs> so it was included in the book. Um, and that was my very earliest piece. And so I don't quite know why as a published composer I started. It was just chance and um, it began with a Christmas carol and hardly a year's gone by since then that I haven't written at least one new one. They're like, well, I said this in the programme, they're like marker posts along my, the road of my life's journey that um, I do very much enjoy Christmas. And why carols? I, I, I don't know. Um, my training was completely classical, but if you enjoy writing tunes and you're not a pop musician, the Christmas Carol is one area where you're still allowed to write a tune. Um, and I think besides that, music critics tend to go on holiday in the month of December. So um, you're kind of immune from nasty things that anyone might say about them. And so there, there, there they are. I mean, every so often a carol, but you're quite right. The Shepherd's Pipe Carol followed hard on its heels. I was 18 in my last year at school. And I took it with me um, in sort of in my suitcase to Cambridge as a student. And then when it was suggested to me at the end of, uh, of my first year, sort of, look, you should do some conducting, um, Mr. Rutter, because it would be good for you. And I thought, mm, okay, I can give it a go. And I thought, well, I'll do a concert in our lovely college hall in Clare College, where I was uh, an undergraduate. And um, 
I had a chamber orchestra, I had a chamber choir, and I thought, well, um, there's not terribly much material of a seasonal nature for that particular combination. Carols tended to be usually with organ at the time. This was a long time ago. And the idea of putting a, a choir and an orchestra together to sing a carol was not something that you encountered as often as you do now. And so I pulled out the Shepherd's Pipe Carol from my suitcase and it got its first airing in the Hall of Clare College, Cambridge in December 19, well never mind the year, it was a long time ago. <laughs> but but uh, it sort of went on from there, really. Well, we've got a lovely question on this very subject from Elizabeth Hamilton. Thank you, Elizabeth. But lovely of you to join us. Um, and she's thanking you for organising this exciting event, but also, are you still writing and composing carols? And from what you've just been saying, it sounds as if every year one sort of appears from somewhere and that's still happening, is it? Well, yes, it is. Um, as a matter of fact, within the last few weeks, I wrote one for Sabrina Terfel. And if you're going to drop a name, you may as well drop a good one. Um, <laughs> Enjoy that. <laughs> he was one of the soloists in a lovely tribute to the Oxford vaccine team, which was put together by the Oxford Philharmonic orchestras found a director Marios Papadopoulos and um, he had his orchestra, he had the choir of Merton College Oxford and he said oh by the way we've got um, Bryn Terfel in a soloist if you want to write a part for him. I thought, what? <laughs> yes um, and so I, I have written uh, this year's one is called Joseph's Carol. Um, and so I'm afraid the tradition does carry on. I mean, I get asked most years. Next year, I've been asked to write one for the Macmillan um, Cancer uh, Fund, which uh, mounts a, a, a lovely carol concert every Christmas. And they like to feature a new carol. And uh, for the first time, they've asked if I would contribute. So between now and next December, I've got to think of something seasonal. <laughs> and, and how does that happen? How do the carols come to you? What's your process? <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, it's, of course, that's, that's a, a, a form of the question that every composer gets asked. Where do you get your ideas from? And uh, I, I don't know. Um, St. Cecilia, perhaps, yes. if you're passing by. Um, but I think she's quite busy at this time of year with um, all sorts of people doing all sorts of music making. Uh, but I like to think she might fly past my window and drop a few little ideas through uh, that I can use if I choose to make use of them. The deadline has a lot to do with it, of course, and um, anybody who has ever had to write essays for um, a teacher will know exactly what that's all about, or journalists who have to produce their thousand words by midnight. Uh, it never gets any easier, by the way. I mean, every time I sit down and write a new piece of any kind, um, it still feels like the first thing I've ever written and I ask myself, well, now where's middle C? No, I can't quite remember. And bit by bit uh, you get over the um, intimidation that uh, the empty page presents to you and you come up with something. Um, the thing is the Christmas story is many-sided. It's got human beings in it, it's got miracles in it, it's got angels and of course angel singers we know um it's got shepherds who pipe um because that's part of their job description they've got to be able to do that and uh, you've got kings who sing a solemn uh, something or other as they kneel and offer their gifts so one way and another there's there's plenty to celebrate and draw inspiration from in the Christmas story itself. And then of course the secular rejoicing. I've written some secular carols as well. So I don't think the well has run dry yet. I mean, composers great and small have been writing carols for centuries and they still continue. I mean, within my lifetime, just think how Benjamin Britten wrote his wonderful ceremony of carols, Vaughan Williams and her both loved carols and wrote some beautiful examples of the genre. It's a form of folk art, really, 
you know, something that belongs to everyone, but composers can add to it. So you just feel that you're one more little tile in a great mosaic of Christmas celebration that has stretched down the centuries. Well, that's a wonderful answer to Elizabeth's question. Just to remind everybody watching, if they use the Q&A function on Zoom, you can get involved as well. Uh, now, I've actually just had another one just come in from uh, Nathan Hayward. And he asks you, John, will it be possible to capture this interview on video to share with just a few other musical friends? Uh, and he names a couple of them. Um, I know I can think I can help with that one, Nathan. This is being recorded and it will be available for you to share as well. So I'm sure you can pass that on. Ah, well, um, Nathan is a very special um, participant indeed, because it's thanks to his generosity and the foundation that he heads up that we were able to make the programme at all. Uh, we weren't sure whether we would be able to take the great risk of doing what was inevitably a big and costly operation. And it was thanks to his spontaneous generosity and kindness that we were able to go ahead. So um, yes, you can enjoy this conversation for as long as you wish and share it with anyone that you so wish, Nathan. And, uh, Warm greetings to you. Very, I'm very much enjoying the sort of general tone of this interview and feeling that we've got friends here with us on the, on the, in the conversation too. So do please uh, do make comments and, and ask questions as I say. Well, Katie, I must tell you that, you know, it's not always sunshine and flowers though, because I once did, um, I think it was a lecture for uh, an American association of church musicians and my reward was a lifetime subscription to their magazine. And I thought, well, fine, okay. And in due course, uh, it arrived. The January issue uh, was the first one that I got. And I tore open my copy and opened it. And it was um, a choir director's diary for the month of January. And the first sentence was, the best thing about January is that I won't have to listen to the candlelight carol for a whole 11 months. And uh, I'm sorry to say that it's in our programme. So whoever wrote that, uh, I, I think will have switched off by, the, had better switch off by then anyway. But it, I think written above every composer's desk in gold letters should be, you can't please everybody. Yeah, exactly, it keeps you humble, John, keeps you humble. <laughs> But we were talking about all the, the, the fact that you've written so many Christmas carols, but of course it's not all Christmas music. And I know this year, in fact, you brought out an album of piano music. Now, were those mostly arrangements of, of choral works or was this some- They were, yes. but yeah. Um, I, 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 am, I have no ambition to be the next Frederick Chopin, uh, but uh, I have been asked um, a number of times over the years, um, look, um, I quite like to play some of your choral pieces by myself at home on the piano and I haven't got a choir in my living room so um, could you make them just for solo piano and it's the kind of job like painting the garage that you never quite get round to in normal times <laughs> and taking advantage of the special circumstances of this year I finally got round to that particular task along with quite a few others that have been waiting some time. And so, yes, there are two volumes of my little choral pieces for piano solo transcribed. And uh, the one thing, of course, that uh, I was not uh, able or willing to do was to play them myself. Um, I, I am not a good pianist, but fortunately I know someone who is. And my old friend and colleague, Wayne Marshall, who happens to be the elder brother of Melanie Marshall, who's one of the soloists on a Christmas celebration. Um, Wayne was available, and I don't know if you know him, Katie, but uh, the thing is, he's a master of improvisation. And uh, I thought, well, I have one challenge here, which is to get him to stick to what I actually wrote. Um, and I said, Wayne, you know, are you willing to do this? Yeah, yeah sure, I'll do it. Um, thing is, he lives in Malta, so I couldn't exercise on the spot control over what he played. But I, I said, look, Wayne, please, just, just, I know you could improve on all of these hugely, but just play what's written. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And actually he did, 
And so we got an album out of it and two books of these transcriptions. And so that was something I've very rarely written for piano. Um, I've very rarely written for organ actually on its own. And the, uh, there's a reason for, well, uh, I haven't written much for piano because my first piano teacher, Mrs. Melville, um, a, a lovely lady, she never actually physically wrapped me over the knuckles, so I'm sure she'd have liked to. I must have been only, seven or eight years old and she leaned over when I'd just given a particularly awful performance of something said John I think you should be a composer or a singer just not a pianist <laughs> and so she was quite right to warn me off and as for the organ well I did uh, persevere any organists among you will know that uh, you've not just got fingers to worry about you've got feet to worry about and the nice thing about the organ exams as they were in those days is that you didn't have to play scales and my scales have always particularly been rubbish um, you know I don't know a violin you're a violinist Katie so well, violin scales are a different challenge aren't they well yes um, it's a challenge on the violin in my view but <laughs> well no no right anyway I thought I had better take the organ seriously for a while the one instrument I'm going to really try my best and in my teenage years I've practiced and practiced and there's a series of exams run by an organization called the Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music and the top grade is grade eight and uh, at that time if you wanted to study music in an English university you had to have grade eight on an instrument and I thought well my only hope is the organ. I played recorder in um, primary school but I wasn't very good at that either. Um, I wasn't even a terribly good singer I'm afraid you know despite Mrs Melville's encouragement I mean I sang in my school chapel choir but I never got the solo in Once in Royal David City, which was always considered the mark of great success. Um, no, my deadly rival Simon Vaughan always got it, but then he did end up singing in the English National Opera. So, I, yeah, it was unfair competition. <laughs> but anyway, I worked and worked on the organ and um, I turned up for the exam and a, a very charming gentleman, youngish man at the time, um, said, oh, well, welcome, you know, please sit down, you know, make yourself familiar with the instrument, there is no hurry. My name is Joseph Horowitz. And of course, Joe Horowitz has uh, become noted as a composer, a Captain Noah and his floating zoo, and the signature tune for Rumpole of the Bailey, and many other fine pieces of composition, very versatile. Um, at the time, he was obviously supplementing his income by doing examining. And um, in those days, you used to get a mark sheet, you know, all handwritten with a signature and all that. And if you got 130 marks or over, that was a distinction. And I just got 130. I'm terribly proud of myself. And I thought, right, I can give up which I did and I've scarcely, and I've played at a few friends weddings since but hardly any, anything. Anyhow, many years later uh, I was at an industry luncheon and uh, this gentleman who looked rather like a chess grandmaster with a domed forehead and those big sad eyes and um, someone introduced me and said, oh John this is Joseph Horowitz. He said, oh he said we have never met. I said, we have, we have. You examined me for grade eight on the organ and you gave me a distinction. And he shook his head and said very sadly, well, I'm sorry to tell you, I know absolutely nothing about the organ. <laughs> Which comes under the heading of things that didn't really need to be said. <laughs> um, but th there we are. All of this is perhaps going some way to explaining why I took to composition. Um, I think all other avenues in the musical world were blocked to me and the nice thing about competition uh, is that well you're only competing with the dead in, in, the, in the world of, of, of the composer and so well there's Bach there I suppose but there's no point in worrying about him he's up there on his cloud and generally speaking living composers are all nice to each other um, that we tend to enjoy each other's successes and to share our experiences 
um, composers get togethers when I've been at them are usually quite jolly, I suppose, because we spend so much time on our own um, when we're working. I mean, in a sense, um, you know, the isolation of 2020 um, didn't come as a great shock to me because I've been working in isolation for many, many years. Although, of course, your other side of your professional life, the conducting, presumably, has been paused rather dramatically. Oh, golly, yes. I mean, it was like having your right arm cut off because a busy diary of conducting in a number of different countries this year, um, events I was really looking forward to, festivals, um, concerts, special, um, this is and that, um, all just melted away to nothing. And I have been fortunate in that my composing side has taken over and that I've been able to get on with things ah, uh, in a way that I mightn't if I had been doing so much conducting. But um, I'm one of those composers that I'm quite a sociable being, I think. And the composition is the pain and the performing is the pleasure that, uh, some composers really enjoy the act of composing. I honestly don't. I enjoy having a piece of music finished and then I can get together with my colleagues and my friends and make it real. And so th that has been difficult, but golly, not so half so difficult for me as for my colleagues who are just performers and have had not only their passion um, taken away, but the the thing that the thing they want to get out of bed for every day, but their livelihood as well. Um, it's a tough time, and we are coming through as best we can. But um, oh gosh, um, I I'm slightly unusual in that I've never wanted to specialise. That um, if I try to compose for three hundred and sixty five days a year, I'd go nuts um, just from the solitude. I think. And if I conducted all the time, I would run out of ideas. I mean, just think how difficult it must be to turn up in front of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra at 10 o'clock on a wet Monday morning and say, well, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a new idea about the Eroica Symphony. And they're going to think, oh, must we? <laughs> and uh, you, you had better have some really good fresh ideas to offer as a conductor. So I'm glad to be able to do it um, when I want to and to retreat to my study when I feel that I've run out of conducting ideas. You've been so steeped in the world of choral music and you've been such an influence. You've provided so much beautiful choral music over the last, what, 40 odd years, 50 years. Um, what's the state of play? <laughs> A mere 20 or so. Thank you, yes. <laughs> How do you feel the state of choral music is in the UK at the moment? Because to me, certainly before this year, it felt like we were, we're really enjoying almost a, a, a golden age, wonderful growth of the number of choirs and different sorts of choirs as well, emerging left, right and centre. Would you agree? Oh, yes, absolutely. It, this will be seen as a golden age for choral music around the world, I think, um, with um, a rude interruption, which I hope will be of not much more than a year's duration. And when you reach a certain age, one year doesn't seem like terribly much. I feel awfully sorry for um, children and young people where one year out of your life is maybe one tenth of your entire lifespan so far. And that is really awful. Um, I'm able to take a bit of a philosophic view and say we will return and choral music will have its former glory again. But yes, in my lifetime, if I had one area of the musical world to be involved in, I could hardly wish for a more exciting one than choral music because simply choirs have got so much better in the time that I have been around. I remember when I was a lad going to a big performance of Bach's B minor mass in the Royal Albert Hall. And I remember it was a large chorus and uh, quite a big orchestra, you know, with the nine foot Steinway as the continuo um, uh, and the Albert Hall organ not holding back either. 
Crazy. And I just remember, think, I didn't know anything, but I remember thinking at the time, well, why is it that the orchestra are in time and in tune, but the, the choir are flat and behind the beat? Well, uh, you know, nobody would accept that now. The, I, I think it's generally expected that choral musicians will have the same level of expertise as instrumentalists will. And that is indeed what's happened. And of course, the other thing that's happened is that what was the male bastion of cathedral choirs and collegiate choirs has opened up to women and not before time. Um, but that has meant that we have got the future members of groups such as the Talis Scholars and Tenebrae and the Sixteen and so on, um, who have many of them been nurtured in the collegiate choirs of Oxford and Cambridge and other universities actually, uh, or in our cathedral choirs. I think 48 of our 50 something cathedral choirs in England now do have girls choirs and that's fabulous. And uh, I think therefore we have had a whole new flowering of, well, very expert amateur chamber choirs and of professional choirs. And of course, these full-time professional choirs and vocal ensembles have made recordings that have raised everybody else's game. Um, recordings have done a great deal to foster choral excellence around the world. And that in turn has meant that we have been able to enjoy the riches of choral repertoire that was previously completely unknown. I remember when um, uh, an award from a magazine we have in this country called Gramophone um, was given to the Talis Scholars for a recording of Masses by Josquin uh, from the early 16th century. Well, nobody had ever heard one note of them really until they were brought to a wide audience from recordings. And of course, it's an ironic fact that actually um, so much of the treasures of church music have become known, not in church, but through recordings made by these kinds of groups. And so it's been wonderful to be part of it. And of course, looking back in my own life history, um, when the first Oxbridge colleges became mixed in the 1970s, I had the great good fortune to be appointed director of music at one of the first three colleges, men's colleges, that admitted women, and that was Clare College. And so overnight, I had the chance to work with a choir of very expert and intelligent young men and women who wanted to sing the sort of repertoire that was previously only associated with boys and men. Our next door neighbours at King's had been merrily singing all of this Palestrina and Joscan and everybody else um, for centuries. But um, for the first time, mixed choirs of young men and women were performing that music and discovering how wonderful it all is. And so uh, it was a great time to be young in the choral world when I started out. And um, I always feel when I write for choir or when I work with a choir or a vocal ensemble like Voce's Eight that we will be hearing now, that in a sense, I'm with family. You know, I'm returning to my own roots as a shy young choir boy. And um, I think I'm still that shy young choir boy inside. We've got a lovely question from Reese Shear Smith, who sends his Christmas greetings to you as well, and asks, uh, what was your inspiration for Star Carol, which is one of their favorites? Oh, that was a phone call. <laughs> um, very simple. I had a good friend that um, some people um, here will probably know called Simon Lindley, who at the time was director of music at St Albans School, which by coincidence was next door to the cathedral where we are performing our celebration. And he used to always make his business phone calls between seven o'clock and eight o'clock in the morning. And I should tell you that I'm a night owl, um, you know, that I often work till after midnight, but I don't care to rise too terribly early. And I just remember, and this is in the days before you necessarily had a phone by your bed, this was a long time ago, a phone rang at uh, seven o'clock and it said, John, hello, Simon Lindley here. How about a carol for the school, my dear chap? And I said, well, when do, when do you want it, son? Shall we say next Tuesday? <laughs> and 
that was no, actually no wait a minute no i think he he was the one who asked me to write the donkey carol the star carol came equally short notice and it was equally a phone call but it was from sir david wilcox so sorry to have misremembered now the star carol was for one of the bar choir christmas concerts at the albert hall where the idea was that the children in the audience could come up and sing along with the Bach choir for um, 15 minutes or so after the interval. Uh, they would all flock up onto the platform and sing away in a manger, but David would say, well, um, let's have a new carol this year, something where the kids can learn it on the stage right there and sing it. And the, the Bach choir can have the twiddly bits, as it were. And so I wrote the Star Carol with that in mind. So it's got quite a, a twiddly uh, verse, but a very simple refrain, see his star shining bright in the sky this Christmas night. And as with everything I wrote, and I think any composer will tell you the same, I thought it would only get one performance. And uh, that has turned out not to be the case. <laughs> Indeed not. A well, lovely question just popped into the uh, Q&A box from John Goodwin, and he's thanking you for all the pleasure that you've given, as we all do. Um, he said, were you 16 today and wanted to aspire to your musical achievements, um, what would they be? What Would they be similar to what you, what you have actually achieved, do you think? Oh, there's an old saying, isn't there? If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> um, I, I can never see past next Tuesday, Katie. I really can't. Um, the, uh, I, I had friends at, at school and at university who had their life mapped out. And in some cases, it's worked out very much like they thought it was going to. In the world of music, for example, and I think just only of conductors, I think it's probably true to say that Sir John Elliot Gardner was absolutely determined he was going to be a conductor specialising in Baroque music. Well, he's broadened out, but that was completely his goal. Um, and then we had um, Sir Mark Elder, as he now is, who wanted to conduct opera. Well, indeed, he has done that and much more besides. I honestly wasn't like that. And I think I'm still trying to make up my mind what I want to do when I'm grown up. Um, I knew it well, I knew I wanted to do music, of course, but I had no idea that um, composition was going to not just be my passion, but my livelihood. I didn't know that it was possible to make a living from composition. And um, I never thought that anything I wrote would, would last. Uh, I remember saying to Sir David Wilcox when we finally received our advanced copies of Carols for Choirs to the Orange book that we'd worked on, I spoke of earlier, mm -hmm. and I said, David, how long would you give it? And he shrugged and said, 10 years at the most. Well, that was 1970 and, and it's still going on. So you can be wrong in your predictions. I think I would say to any young musician, um, make yourself if you, the best at it that you possibly can. Take every opportunity, if you're a composer, to hear your work performed. Listen to what the performers tell you and um, try to broaden the range of what you do. I mean, people sometimes say, young aspiring composers, oh, I want to write church music. And I said, well, write string quartets as well, or write electronic installations, or just anything that will expand your range. Uh, you will find your gift if you have one, and uh, the public will perhaps help you to discover it by either accepting or rejecting what you do. Um, I, I, I really had no plans when I was that age. I had no idea what was going to happen in my life, and... I'm very, very fortunate that music has played um, the major part in it and that I have managed to survive. And I think I've probably been extremely blessed that I've been able with what I write to touch people's hearts. And I think that's probably something most composers would want written on their tombstones. Of course, we all want um, to be praised for our technique. And I think every writer, whether it words or music or sculpture or painting, would like to have it also on their tombstone. 
he or she wrote like an angel. <laughs> um, but of course, you only uh, get admired for your technique by fellow professionals, really. And um, for touching people's hearts, um, yes, you can write to put the music away in a drawer. Um, and that's pretty much what I did with the Shepherd's Pipe Carol, I remember. And I only pulled it out because there was an occasion where I thought it might come in useful. But mostly, I think we do want to reach out to listeners. Um, I always think of my parents. My, my dad was very fond of music, but he had no musical training. And I've hoped that with some of what I have written, if he was sitting in the front row, uh, he might be able to smile and enjoy it. And I would rather have that sort of an audience, I think, than an audience of specialists, people who have a deep and profound knowledge of all that's going on in contemporary music. Though, I mean, I hasten to say that I love to seek out the avant-garde, the latest, um, whatever's going on, what's new. And I just know that that's not my particular gift um, as a writer, that I'm more songwriter than composer probably. Um, and uh, I think you're still allowed to write a tune if you're a songwriter and indeed expected to. It's been a very fortunate life and to someone starting out, I would say, um, go seek your fortune. Be prepared for setbacks and disappointments because they will certainly come. Um, bear in mind that just as with your real life personality, if your music has a personality, not everyone's going to like it. That's a lesson you have to learn in the playground at school. Um, you know, you may think you're okay as a person, but for no reason, there will be people who just don't like you. Um, and that's, that's a hard lesson actually. And it's a hard lesson in music, but you have to just push on. We all have to have a bit of a steely core of self-belief. Uh, as a composer, because if you didn't have that, you'd never pick up your pencil. Um, and you have to be able to withstand setbacks and disappointments to be quite determined. And I do think that you should always try to improve your skills as you go along. And people say to me, have you got a favourite piece among those that you've written? And the honest answer to that is always the next one that I haven't written yet because I hope to learn from my mistakes and to try and get a little bit better before I stop being able to do anything. <laughs> that doesn't feel like that's imminent at all. A oh, final question from Hugh Davis, who wants to know what your interests and passions are outside of music. My, my family, of course, my friends. Uh, I don't do a lot of spectacular things like mountain climbing. You know, I, I did conduct down an old um, iron ore mine in Norway last year, uh, but that was actually musical because I was conducting a choir. Down extreme, a, extreme conducting, uh, I think I'd call it. It, it was an example of extreme conducting, yes. Um, I, I don't have any hobbies because music is so many sided that, um, as I explained before, if I get tired of conducting, I turn to composing for a while and vice versa. And I also very much enjoy record production because as a record producer, um, you sit behind the glass and you have to be both cheerleader and critic. And that's, that's an interesting job. You don't have to dress up for it, which is easier than conducting. They have to put all that gear on. Um, and uh, you don't have quite the stress of conducting, but uh, at the same time, you're still doing a useful job and um, encouraging whoever is performing and recording to give us their very, very best. So um, in a way, I would almost say that's my hobby, or at any rate, it's my sideline. Um, we could talk about my cookery, but that would be a very brief conversation. Um, my other half, Joanne, is much better at it than I am. Um, but I enjoy helping out in the kitchen um, with simple recipes, mainly Italian, that you can't do much damage to. Um, so will you be so chef for Christmas lunch? Are you, you, you 
drafted in to get involved with, uh, you know, putting crosses in the bottom of the sprouts or anything like that? Um, no, I'm firmly kept out of the kitchen <laughs> because I really could mess that up. And the timing is everything with cooking your, your... I don't much like turkey, I'm afraid. It's the one thing I don't like about Christmas, but Joanne and I both love goose. Um, and so, sorry veggies or vegans who may be listening to this, but I do enjoy a nice Christmas goose. Very Dickensian, isn't that right? Yes, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I can feel another carol coming on somehow. <laughs> there must be a yes. goose carol in there somewhere. A goose carol. Um, well, uh, we can look forward to that or not for next year. John, it is such a pleasure chatting with you as always. I, as I've said to you before, I have such happy memories of uh, I was practicing for Brother Heinrich's Christmas many moons ago when you very kindly asked me along to take part in one of these Christmas concerts. It was the most beautiful interpretation of my oh, little Christmas well, fame. Uh, know, it's still engraved in my heart, Katie. <laughs> oh, you smoothie. Now, come on. <laughs> Never argue with a compliment my granny always said to me. <laughs> so have a wonderful Christmas, but thank you all for watching this interview and any of you who are watching it in the future. It's been, I'm sure, for you, as it has been for me, lovely to hear John's thoughts on Christmas and carols and indeed this concert. And listen, let's all go and prepare ourselves now for the most wonderful evening of music. Thanks to the RPO and all your musical friends and colleagues. And uh, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a wonderful concert. Thank you, John. Take care and happy Christmas. <laughs>